Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, I'm joined with my two good friends from high school, Nate and Tanner. And we are getting on this podcast to reflect upon an event we recently went to out in California. A few months ago, I did an episode with this guy named Grim Grizz. I had kind of found him through the Peterson rabbit hole. And he was saying to me, you should come to this conference. And I was like, well, I did some looking. And I guess the people that were going were some of Peterson's colleagues, one of them, one of them being John Verveke, another being Jonathan Paggio. And there were a few other speakers going. And I was talking to Nate and I was like, hmm, maybe we should go. And then I realized like, huh, Tanner's out in California. And he's also studying philosophy and he knows a lot more about that topic than me anyways so he would be very useful to tag along and so before we knew it we had booked some plane tickets and tanner picked us up from the airport and we attended the conference and we decided to sit down to talk about it so yeah thanks guys for coming on heck yeah yeah no, thanks, thanks for, for having me. me thank you tanner for uh being our uh personal uh, <laughs> what was the term F for sure or for sure what's the term what is that uh, chauffeur uh, uber driver i don't know we'll just go with that chauffeur, chauffeur. thank you, thank you. <laughs> God, just bloody blank in there like, oh God. yeah it's not like a bloody idiot but yeah anyway. yeah thanks so, tanner but it was a lot of fun for but, sure yeah, it was go. good. yeah we yeah we checked out tanner's college which is really cool it's like a christian college out in the hills of beverly hills or not quite but kind of over near la over there in malibu and i guess we weren't exactly sure what to expect. We were like, I've really no idea who's going to go to this kind of thing. It's hosted at a church, but it's not a typical church event. And I, I was asking myself, why am I going a thousand miles or whatever away to go visit a church? And, but like, as the answer was that I wanted to, well, see Tanner and meet these people. Just, it was an interesting opportunity. And I guess. Would you say, like, what would you say the demographic would be? Like, how would you categorize the demographic for a group like this that, that were the people in these groups? Like, could you guys give kind of like a, a metric that you were kind of seeing? Like, I'm just curious. Yeah, so uh, I'd say mostly men, which is interesting. Not overly surprising given personality data. Um, and then I'd say we were some of the youngest people there. Most people were probably between the ages of 30 and 50, I would guess, um, tilting towards probably that 40, 50 range mark maybe. So I don't know. That, that's the main demographic, um, mm -hmm. mostly white men, which isn't overly surprising given it's the U.S., but sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess the title for this conference was A Quest for a Spiritual Home, which – is an interesting concept because I guess as humans, we all kind of have this like thirst for more or thirst for community and connection and peace and love. And you can find it in all kinds of different ways, whether that be people, places, uh, maybe mental states. And yeah, I, I guess that was kind of the takeaway. Like I'm trying to think like, how would you guys define spiritual home? What about you, Tanner? What do you think of this whole idea of spiritual home? Um, I mean, I think they were talking about an emphasis on it being like an immaterial thing that's kind of connects people. Like, um, you know, it's not like a specific location physically, but it's just like someplace inside of yourself that is interconnected with others i guess that's how what i would think about it sure hmm okay yeah it is a very unique concept which is part of the draw actually initially for the conference i was like okay this is going to be an interesting topic um i'll just go straight into the the meat here verveke john verveke who is a I believe in, is it a neuroscience? He, he's a neuroscience guy, is that right? Yeah, like cognitive science. Science. Like, yeah. He's, he's a focus on psychology. Brilliant man, brilliant. Um, he, he made this quite evident, which is that we actually need a home. So this idea of like a home, a spiritual home, whatever that word home means, from an evolutionary perspective, he talked about this, is like critical for our survival. Because if you were 
we're, you know, we're very tribalistic, our roots are, and we still are today, and we see that in politics and culture today. But if you didn't have a home, if you didn't have a tribe, if you didn't have a group, you basically were dead. So our, our evolutionary pressure to be within a home is very true. So from a practical standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. Now, when you inject the spiritual aspect to that, that brings a whole nother set of questions that I think the conference tried to bring up these questions. I don't know necessarily that it gave me a ton of answers, but each of these speakers kind of had a unique perspective there on this this concept of a spiritual home. And and one more thing I'll say is like I th- this even the word spiritual is a bit oh, maybe even archaic. Like, we seem to have lost connection with what this terms mean, what, what the term means in Western culture, I would argue, in that we're, we're very prefrontal cortex heavy. Um, concepts such as spirituality and consciousness and things like this are very archaic to us. And yet, I would argue, and I think Viveki argued this too, that we need to address the question of spirituality, morality, ethics more now than ever because we have things that are coming down the pipes that require us to have answers to these things or we all die. And his example was AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. And, you know, another classic example would be, you know, the atom bomb, perhaps. But maybe I went a little bit too far down this road already but uh that that idea and that like well, these are the stakes like we actually need to address this question really captivated me so yeah yeah it's interesting that we kind of live in a society and a world where we're so interconnected in the way that we kind of are like we're able to have this conversation so far apart but also like our families are not as connected as they used to be like in the sense of like our grandparents and their friends and all the like you live with your grandparents and your uncles and you're all just a tribe whereas like you felt you knew what was home whereas now you can go move out and live by yourself with no one and like sure you have connection through social media but you're not like connected in that same way and maybe that's something that a lot of these people were searching for which is you know a place to connect with people and to find that immaterial object that you were talking about, Tanner, that is just that timeless conversation and connection. And yeah, I found that it's kind of sad in some ways that we live in a world where this conference has to exist almost, where it's like so many people are questing for this community and this connection. Whereas back in the day, it seemed like that was not as much of a problem. People had that connection every day. And I just found that kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, that idea that like we the the technological revolution that we live in has now enabled people to live outside of what normally would be relatively tiny geographical boundaries. And one of the consequences of that is this newfound chasm of meaning and um, uh, I guess a lack of a sense of belonging that is a problem now that's more pervasive than it would have been in the past simply because of the fact that you were basically stuck in the same, you know, 100 square mile area for the majority of your life. And now I would argue that overall it's been a net good, the fact that we have this freedom, but with freedom uh, comes new problems sometimes, and this is one of those problems. So it's fascinating. Tanner, any... um. Any thoughts on that right there? Um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, we're social creatures by nature. And I think a lot of um, what we've come across in today's um, world is kind of uh, making us more antisocial just in general. Um, like we're absorbed sometimes in screens and, and not interacting with people that are like right next to us. Um, and I think... And it makes us feel like it is a type of interaction, like it's interpersonal interaction. Like you could sit in your house by yourself and be on a screen and it doesn't like 
innately feel bad when you're doing it um but it's not the same and i think a lot of people interchange it for interaction with people which isn't good in the long term for like their health and for the health of the society as a whole um, because we are all you know rational creatures that are supposed to be going out and doing work and communicating and growing from one another and all sorts of things and i feel like the kids that might be growing up like right now might have an aspect of this that's really stunted no for sure yeah, that's a great point mm. yeah so i guess mm. the next like i guess we walk into this church mm. we i guess the people there like it seemed like any person that I kind of went up to or the person we sat down with, like Tanner was sitting next to a guy named Blad, and instantly he started talking to us and like, he seemed like an inquisitive, interesting man. He, you know, the people like, I guess there's this ter phrase that we should define real quick that this group defined, which is like this phrase of estuary, mm. which is a term for like a, a riverbed meeting an ocean, like where that mm. meets. And I guess this idea of like a small group discussion, sit down in a circle where each person contributes is this idea of an estuary. And I was curious what you guys thought of this whole estuary, like the name of it, plus the experience going through it. Like Nate, if you want to start and then Tanner, you can give some thoughts. Sure. Too. Sure. I, it was a new, you know, term I, I would i would say i obviously knew what it meant but i remember walking in and hearing that it, we walked in and we, they were like oh people are in estuary groups right now and we're like what the fuck is that <laughs> <laughs> like what <laughs> and i mean i guess I, I have mixed feelings about this term i'm like effectively all it is is a discussion group mm -hmm. which i mean more power to discussion groups uh no problem there but it was a bit odd that w they had designated a term for it that was beyond just discussion group. I guess I, I think part of the reason is because at least from a philosophical perspective, they're focused on this concept of logos and finding logos, which essentially is it's similar to this idea of truth or wisdom, uh, spoken, spoken word that leads towards truth is another way to think about it. So, I mean, there's definitely a niche there, which is why I think they felt it necessary to, you know, designate a special niche term to what they're doing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It was just kind of funny that we walked in and we're like, what is that? Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I'm all for the, the objective of the estuary groups. I'm all for, I mean, bringing together different people's perspectives and, you know, trying to cultivate wisdom among each other. I mean, more power to them as far as I'm concerned. So what do you think, Tanner? I mean, yeah, I'm on the same board uh, with you, Nate. I think that it was kind of interesting to see the term, and they do talk about dialogos a lot, like the trying to find truth through discussion, I think, which is, you know, it's good. Um, and, yeah, I don't really have much to say about that. I think it's definitely a good thing to be doing, obviously. Like, some people need to... Um, some people don't have people in their lives that they can discuss these types of things with, and like it might be very useful or beneficial for them in ways that we don't know and you know if the terminology that they use and the way they go about it is what brings them together then i'm all for it exactly no that's yeah, a very good point well like said. like it at the end of the day the fact that they're focusing on something that is so critical is the point so yeah i'm with you there because more discussion is needed these days rather than less so for sure yeah and what what speakers put, stood out to you the most i guess as a starting block for sure yeah uh I, i'll go first real quick so i would say verveki um so i knew what's interesting is tenor probably knew these people the least that's probably the probably true here but he might have um, known the concepts the most yeah that's the interesting thing is they referenced a lot of concepts in the philosophical world that like not to rank order this but tanner probably knew the majority of the terms i knew the second most in harley 
you know, tried, but not mess around. But, you know, <laughs> it, there was a lot of like philosophical language that that was like <laughs> kind of niche. Like if you if you either knew it or you didn't, and it wasn't concepts that like you could just like, oh, okay, now I get it. Like there were big umbrella terms that needed exploration. So what I appreciated, I'll just go here real quick. What I like about Verveke is he was very um, scientific and had a very had a talk about the concept of a spiritual home that was primarily based upon his um, his exploration of the data surrounding evolutionary biology and this concept of a hearth and a home and how critical it is for uh, you to survive. So he was trying to get at kind of the root of where this concept comes from and why we might be feeling a lack of it at the moment. And we talked a little bit about already about why, even from a practical perspective, we might be lacking this concept of a home or hearth. But from a spiritual perspective, um, you know, I'll just I'll, I'll bring it back to Nietzsche. You know, God is dead. Like we're definitely living through a secular time, and Verveke, I think, did an excellent job of showing that this has deep evolutionary biological roots. And we shouldn't just ignore this because obviously there's a void here and we, we, we just can't ignore some of these things because they're so deeply ingrained with us. So I liked his talk the best and there's a bunch of topics we could go in with about his talk, but I want to give Tanner a quick chance to chime in here. Um, yeah, if I had to say What's the your favorite? two favorites, it's either Verveki or Paggio. Um, I think I probably got more out of what Verveki had to say but I I liked and you know I agree I think with what where Paggio was trying to go and what he was saying um so yeah I just I think that for me though they both had you know good substance and I'd probably say yeah Verveki is probably the one that I enjoyed the most um and I like the way the way that he he's just a good presenter you know like the way that he talks the way that he conveys his mm. ideas I kind of like the way that he did that um and I think he did a pretty good job of like laying out a path that was that we could follow reasonably easy. Um, you know, sometimes it's sure. not an uh, easy thing to do. But yeah. Yeah. On the topic of Verbeke, I like that, you know, this conference was majorly probably a Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Christian, those would maybe be the three biggest groups of people there yep. in regards to religion. Maybe some agnostics too. But like Verveke was like he's thrown into this like, you know, environment as a black sheep almost, but he's totally willing to have these discussions and, you know, strong man the religious arguments that the other people might bring to the table. And I just find that to be pretty useful. Like not only is he just talking about religion, he's using neuroscience to back up why we might, for example, need a home or a hearth or why we might be able to realize what is relevant in our lives or what is relevant in front of us, like that relevance realization term, which was talked about quite a bit. I just find it – that for me, it's like easier to almost grip like the science and why than the, the symbolism – that can occur because like the symbolism sometimes it's like they make a jump about what the symbol might represent but i'm like still trying to figure out why it might represent that and they've already made the jump and they're moving on whereas verveki might he might explain a concept because of a biological mechanism in the brain and then i can be like oh, okay i can get behind it it makes a little more sense than just a i'll i'll take i'll take your word pajo about the symbolism meaning that like I bet you're probably right, but, like, it's harder for me to just instantly, like, accept it and believe, if you know what I mean, without questioning. But that was something I noticed. But, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, it was interesting to see him. He was kind of a black sheep. That's a really good point. Um, and yet, I... I so admire him because he was willing to have these conversations and interact with someone who's very religious and symbolic, who's Jonathan Peju. I mean, he's just extremely 
down a, in in my opinion a different train than Verveke, and yet they could hang together and kind of you know try to intertwine their their ways of thinking, which I appreciated. I think on a somewhat comical and dark note, which is my job, uh, Verveke. I think part of the reason he was there is because he's so absolutely petrified what's coming down the pipes with AGI that he's like, oh, crap. You know, maybe Carl Jung was right, and we need to rethink our moral substrate and moral sy- symptoms as we try to program in these things into AI. And if we can't even decide, you know, what a woman is, how in the hell are we going to be able to, you know, implement, you know, proper ethics and values into these systems that we don't even understand. So I think he is accurately recognizing, and as I hope more and more what you would call traditionally secular people in academia in general would recognize, is that if we don't have a bloody conversation about this stuff, if we don't start seriously unpacking what it means to be a person, what good and evil is, what morality is, what does it mean to live a good life, what are the objectives that we want in life, you know, is it pure hedonism? Is it meaning? Is it a spiritual home? What does that entail? Like, these are all questions that need to be answered, and the secular world doesn't have good answers for them. And, and, and I think all the data backs it up. So I think Verveke's recognized that, and he's like, well, shit. <laughs> Maybe that means I need to go to a Protestant church. And he kind of recognized this, which is an interesting point here we could touch on, too. Like, I think he was talking to uh, Vanderclay. Paul Vanderclay, and they had an exchange where towards the end of it, Verveke was like, he said something like, and this is exactly what needs to happen, like this right now, like this conglomeration of this many different thinkers and people within the religious and philosophical realms coming together in this way is exactly what needs to happen. And it was funny because he was almost like brought to a stunned silence at the epiphany of the moment in that the conversation that was going on was exactly what needed to happen. And I think that is a big theme throughout the weekend. Like that, that record, the recognition, oh gosh, I butchered that of the critical nature of the task at hand of this spiritual home idea was front and center. And I think, I think it's true. So long rant, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I just wanted to add, um, I think we see a lot of people um, in our society that uh, refrain from talking about a lot of things, even with people that they're like supposedly close to or supposed to be close to. It's like they just refuse to go into topics that like might be uncomfortable or cause or like make someone feel like they could be wrong about something or that you know they might be ignorant or they just lack something in some way and i think that's kind of the good thing about a conference like this or the types of conversations that you have there is that it's like um you know it's like it's the way that it should be it's like you're trying to get at the truth you're not afraid to not to acknowledge your ignorance or like uh realize that you're wrong or need to learn something else but it's like trying to get somewhere with hard conversations that a lot of people either don't want to take like don't have the willingness uh to take seriously because they do take work or they just don't want to because they might be apprehensive about the where it could lead them or the emotions involved yeah it's interesting like do you guys feel like you can have these kind of conversations with your close friends or with your family? Like, is that something that you guys, like, are you questing for that regularly or is that muscle being, or is that, you know, being itched for you? Do you feel fulfilled in this dimension? It's a great question. Tanner, you could continue cause you were on this topic. Um, I think with my friends, I'm fortunate enough where I can go into these types of things. And honestly, like, I think it's actually a blessing to it's obviously a blessing to have people around that you can do that with but more so 
like I want you to I want you to show me that I'm wrong. Like if you can show me that I'm wrong about something, then I will happily change that because then I'm closer to the truth than I was before and I won't have to die in my ignorance and doing something the wrong way. Um but I guess in terms of So whoa whoa whoa. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. On that on that note of you well doing said. things wrong. Uh have you ever uh I'm just I'm just having fun here, but yeah, have you ever yeah. taken a look at the text messages that you send after you send them perhaps? <laughs> because sometimes Harley and I have a grand old time of this is sometimes we, we have a we have a fun time trying to decipher what in fact you meant because <laughs> sometimes they are pretty uh pretty impressive. So they're uh this is just a comical point here but i just i think it's pretty funny so there we'll, we'll add one to your list of things to re uh re-look into <laughs> that's fair i don't Dang. i'll have to look at some of the most recent ones i might have yeah maybe i'm too vague sometimes and picking out what i'm talking about because there's like a long thread or something that's a fair point yep <laughs> text is also pretty rough T general. text is rough too I'll, yeah fair, fair yeah. point fair point but continue you want people to tell you when you're wrong. Yep. Yes, and I guess the other part of that I was going to say was um, I think with my family I can kind of have these types of conversations, mm. but not as much as I would like to. Uh, that's part of just, I don't know, part of, I guess I could try more in some ways maybe, but it's also, you know, kind of, hard to do if like they won't meet you in certain areas to engage in those conversations which sometimes occurs but sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it's good um but yeah i guess that's where i would say patrepticizing comes in my favorite word anyways that's all <laughs> explain that word Define for the it. people who might not understand yeah that's basically like uh for those religious people out there like proselytizing like bringing into the fold which it, the fold would be of philosophy so it's like just making people think more critically like further their skill of critical thinking and analyzing why they believe what they believe should they believe it so it's kind of like it's a dialogue that you have with someone without trying to like bash them or prove that you're right but trying to just like question them and make them want to engage in conversation towards uh the truth and whether or not they actually have it. Mm. Yeah, that's great. We need more people to patrepticize themselves and others. Regularly. Yes. Self-examination. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Nate? Do you feel like, well, I probably, I think I already know this answer, but like you have me kind of, and you have your family, but if you want to answer the same question or we can move on. I'll make it quick. Um, overall, I'd say I'm blessed to have enough people in my life that I can explain my thoughts on a fairly regular basis. So we'll leave it at that. Obviously, there's certain conversations that I tend to not have with my family, and there's certain conversations that I won't have with my friends. Uh, and that's where I'll quick make a uh, counselor plug here. Hmm. That's where a counselor comes in, uh, someone that's just removed from all personal aspects of your life. And it's a completely objective voice in that chaos. So highly recommend that. But yeah. Very true. Opinion. Very true. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Just a final little nail to nail this point down. I think I think it was Verveki who was like, the family dinner table should be a place for these types of discussions. You know, like mm -hmm. that's just a – it's true. Like maybe as we become fathers, we can lead the house and patrepticize – our kids and our wife and who knows you know that seems like a good goal and at the table the kids are always like hmm, what's what are they going to talk about tonight you know <laughs> but that's just a yep. forward thinking thought but oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah one i want to bring up this point as well from for Yep. orient yourself towards the good the true and the beautiful to be free from the evil, false, and ugly. And it's like, we, I guess we live in a culture where it's like, I want to be free to have, you know, ultimate decision-making over my life. I want to be free to, without any consequences, without any regulations, or 
yeah, without any regulations. And I guess there's this idea of like sometimes you have to orient yourself and limit your orientation to specific things because if you just – if you're open-ended in your orientation, you're kind of aimless. And like the goal here I guess is to point upward, to point towards what is going to be good. And that actually will free you and like your trajectory will move away from the evil, false, and ugly in life. And I find that to be cool. It kind of ties in with this like discipline equals freedom. If you have the discipline to look up and – aim towards that good and beautiful and true you're gonna you're gonna be at least a lot better than you were the day before and probably help the people around you in that process and i find that just to be a a pretty cool phrase like good true beautiful yeah Mm -hmm. yeah no i really like his um his differentiation between good true and beautiful and, and kind of putting them all in one um i don't know phrase there i suppose because i've always kind of like I guess when people ask me, like, what are you pursuing? I'll be like, well, the truth or the good. But kind of putting in that beautiful component is – I really like that, the way that he phrased it there. And real quick on the whole um, responsibility freedom point. Yeah, we – our culture today is is obsessed with maximizing freedom, but only freedom of one particular kind, which is freedom to pursue your – personal hedonic whims is what i would call it and it's not a freedom it's the pursuit of pleasures the pursuit of short-term happiness it's not the pursuit of meaning it's not the pursuit of long-term moral character building actions um and what you find is as you point out harley is when you narrow your focus when you hypothetically discipline yourself when you in somewhat some sense limit your freedom you maximize your meaning you you open up this new realm of freedom in a sense and when you impose limitations on things that happens all the time and one example is chess the game of chess chess without arbitrary what seemingly are arbitrary limitations would cease to exist as a game and in order to play the game you have to impose limitations upon yourself and all these new possibilities and freedoms um, become possible because of that limitation. And I think life, and specifically moral character and family and meaning, follow this similar pattern of you have to impose limitations on yourself to then narrow your focus to then ultimately be more free and not a slave to your hedonic desires. So, Tanner, what do you think about that? I like the analogy. I think that's good. I think... Um... Yeah, I like to add to it, if you could do whatever you wanted with, like, chess, then what? how would that be fun? You could just, the game would be over, it, or it wouldn't ever begin. Um, I think... Yep. <laughs> start the game. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess what you guys are talking about makes me kind of think about, like, the stoic idea of freedom which is like very so like very similar it's on the same line of thought which is like yeah you're gonna be you're not gonna know what to do you're not gonna you're gonna be aimless um and you're gonna be distraught and you're gonna be upset probably about a lot of things if you make like freedom to be all-encompassing and that you want whatever it is that you want and that's that's like um Every, every want that you have, I should say, it should be fulfilled. And it's like you have to limit your scope of freedom to see what it really is that you do have freedom over. Because there's a lot of things that you don't and a lot of people think that they do or they get upset or they get frustrated at the events and outcomes of certain things in life. But it's like those things aren't really up to you to begin with. So it's not something that you can control so it shouldn't be where your desire is placed, I guess, is what I think of when we talk about freedom. Mm. Yeah, the Stoics really, really hammer that concept of freedom well overall. Um, and then one of – I'll quick bring this up, and Harley, you can, you can comment on that too. But like uh, Peju talked about this concept of freedom in the context of letting go. 
And he used the example of Isaac, where um, Abraham had to give up his son Isaac, whom he had been desperately trying to have for a long, long period of time. And then what happened in the story is he gave up this most precious, most precious thing, actually, to be killed. And then God gave it back, in a sense. So God didn't go through with it. He decided, you know, hypothetically, that he didn't want Abraham to do that. And that analogy Peugeot used quite a bit, this idea of, like, once you give up your most, what about, like, like, this act of giving up gives you freedom in that you find a much greater sense of freedom once you detach yourself from these things that have held you as a slave in such an emotional way. And I think this is also kind of at the center of Stoicism, um, which is relevant here. I almost felt like when Peja was talking, he was giving like a Stoic talk. I'm like, That's yeah. how I felt. <laughs> Yeah, is that you? Same same thoughts, Tanner. Yeah, yeah. That's why I thought yeah. I liked what he okay. said. I'll give you more say, but yeah, no, it was very like stoicism, but kind of with like a Christian lens. It felt like a little bit, little bit different, but very similar. Um, yeah, yeah. It kind of ties in with this idea of disappointment that Pajot was talking about, where it's like if you put all of your eggs in one basket or if you put all of your focus and attention and hope on whether that be your relationship or your business or your friend or yourself you're gonna ultimately be disappointed because none of those things in and of itself can be the full can, can bring that full fulfillment that pursuing that higher goal which is what is good true and beautiful which can maybe include the relationship the business the friendships, but it's like when you're so single axiomed, it's going to burn you. It's like this idea that some people are talking about like having a hamster in your hand. Like you want that optimal grip. It's like not too loose or you might not be able to keep the goal with you, but like too tight, it might escape you or you might kill the dream. And it's kind of interesting that you're like, you're going to have to have the discipline to like you know, back off and like, allow the goal to not be the only thing that drives you like have that i don't exactly even fully know what it means but it's like have that higher goals above these menial goals and then those goals will be a great by byproduct of pursuing the better higher goal i guess i found that kind of an interesting topic i agree i could go off on that for a minute yeah. if you um Go. Go. Yeah, I, I think that I guess when we were listening to what they had to say, I was thinking a lot about um, another reason that I feel like this ties into stoicism is like that idea of really it's like um, not even like the highest goal that you should have. It's it's the, the goal that I feel like that uh, positions us towards what is you know, meaningful and worth pursuing is something that it's not like an end goal that you actually attain. It's like something you're always trying to reach. Um, but I guess on a furthermore, I think that instead of the outcome of like reaching a specific goal, it's the how you go about reaching the goal, like how you try to reach it, like the way that you go about that. And like the fact that like you've you can look at something and you can say, I've done everything that I can to do to do this right and do it the right way and get to the goal. But if that does the goal isn't there, if I don't meet the expected outcome, that's not on me. That's I couldn't do anything about that. That's not up to me. But I can control the way that I act and the how I go about it. And I think I like that aspect of it that ties in. Yeah, not for sure. That concept of, like, as Peterson talks about, doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it's, you know, how you play the game. You know, that old that old saying that your parents would tell you. Uh, but it's true, you kind of give up the outcome um, because what's within your control is how you play the game. Your moral actions, your ethics, 
your your aim. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to hit the aim. Um, and you could even incorporate a concept of heaven here. Uh, we're never going to reach heaven. And this is something that they talked about in the conference. Like, I think Pejo specifically was like, look, this concept of reaching nirvana or, you know, the perfect spiritual home in, in the context of the conference on earth isn't going to happen. So, and from a Christian perspective, that then will happen when you're hypothetically reunited with God, whatever that means. Um, but that's not me denigrating it, by the way. I'm just openly saying I, I don't know what that means. Uh, it, like, that concept of, you know, being real. I don't know if it's, like, realistic, but, like, being pragmatic down to earth uh about like what exactly we're pursuing we're not pursuing heaven we're not pursuing utopia you know we could go in that direction of like utopian thinking of like we're going to reach this perfect society is just it's just false i think it was churchill that said like yeah capitalism is like the worst system except for all the other ones like like it's the same idea like let's be realistic about what we're talking about here um and i i thought that was useful to kind of frame the conversation so that was <clears throat> i know tanner was showing me some like different other what's the right word governmental structures in his oh. <laughs> what's that book that you were talking about Tanner? well i was like, actually about to mention it because they briefly mentioned plato's republic because they were yeah. like yeah we're not pursuing we're not aiming at plato's republic because that's like the perfect city um we're like aiming towards something similar but it's not like the goal because we know it can't be attained. Um, yeah, that's the book. It does talk about a lot of different societal structures. And um, yes, I guess I would say go read the book. It's worth what reading. Book? <laughs> Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic. Oh, yes. that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. I kind of want to quick slide into talking about our conversation with Grim Grizz real quick mm. because he he was probably my favorite person to meet this whole trip just because I kind of have a special relationship with him had a few converses with him online you know had an estuary with him <laughs> but either way uh one thing that I I guess it was interesting that I heard Vander Clay talk about Grim Grizz once on a video saying that the heart of the Grim Grizz channel is speaking to the people who are alone but not alone online. The people who may have not that many humans around them but are being raised by machines or the people that are mainly looking at screens. And Grim is like this kind of leader that's kind of showing like there's a way out of just being alone on your screens and that is through this connection that we're building. But either way, he I kind of asked him, so like, well, when I was talking with him remotely, he said that he calls himself the cautionary tale. And I was curious, like, why do you call yourself that? And he was like, well, because I played video games for like, you know, 25 years straight and didn't really pursue real life because the video games were too interesting. And I just found that to be an interesting. I just found that to be interesting because it's like. I could see myself taking that path if I would have taken different actions as a high schooler because I really liked video games a lot. And it's interesting kind of bringing up like this AI that Nate's always talking about, which is like nowadays the video games are getting more and more advanced. And like now maybe you can have a real conversation with your video game and with that world and and like you're questing for a spiritual home or you're questing for that home. You don't have it anywhere in your real world, but now we're finding it in the fake world. But I just found that to be kind of a interesting thing that he mentioned that hmm, that can be a probably a danger for a lot of young men in general. Like when they're not given maybe the tools to strive in the real world, they'll find other means. And I find that kind of interesting and kind of sad but it's a good lesson what yeah he was think? a he was a fascinating cat to talk to he was big fan uh on that point real quick what's interesting too is like what basically drove the development of 
greater processing power and graphics cards was video games. Like, that's kind of what pushed... Because it was an obvious, like, you know, moneymaker, I suppose, from a, you know, capitalistic perspective of, like, okay, what's actually going to drive innovation? And in this case, it was video games. And it's crazy how you now, today, and this is only going to get better, can completely immerse yourself in a fictional world that is not real, in a sense, and yet your imagination and the sensory input and the video input and etc. is so powerful that you can get more absorbed into that such that real life no longer seems worth living in the traditional sense. You'd rather live in the game. This is happening at scale at the moment, and from what I can tell, it's only getting worse to a certain extent. And that's not me bashing video games, like I'm all for video games, but you can definitely make the case that too much is is a bad idea. And I think we're definitely seeing that. And we're it's only going to get better too, which is kind of part of the AI point. Like they're only going to get more personalized and more crafted to immerse you and to draw you in. And how we respond to that is just gonna get more and more relevant. So, uh. yeah, <laughs> you never know what's happening coming up next, but yeah, uh, let's see here. Yeah. Grim was interesting. Do you have any thoughts, Tan, or what do you think? Uh, for the next speaker. I guess I could add that I, maybe before I was thinking about technology as a whole before the conference but after like interacting with uh grim i do like video games are honestly going to be like I i'm all for video games too but they are going to be like an issue like it's going to get really crazy i feel like um ai aside like the way that you can immerse yourself and inter interact with um a fictional world because it's only going to get more and more intoxicating and more um, desirable and people are already like taking years just interacting with that and not real life and that's just gonna um, have like an exponential curve I feel like yeah what do you think uh, Socrates thinks of video games Tim? <laughs> <laughs> that is a question that is unanswerable but <laughs> yeah there's until, a good chance until until hold up until oh no well until oh, we hook up no. no yeah yeah you know where i'm going you know where i'm fucking i disagree going. this is what we're gonna do we're gonna <laughs> shut up tanner we're gonna we're gonna infuse an ai with all of socrates writings and what writings his commentary on his writings and and <laughs> you know what i'm talking about enough about him uh and we're gonna get okay, maybe not Socrates, but it's gonna work for <laughs> philosophers, where we have enough input, we have enough, <laughs> we have enough data to, um, you know, create the spirit of Socrates or the spirit of Nietzsche, and you'll be able to ask them those questions. Yeah, I'd be curious to see to answer them. how that goes because I'm wondering like how advanced it would get because there would have to be a difference between it like understanding the thoughts and ideas of like the writings but like you know that that's just the writings like where does it go outside of that like where does it go in everyday types of types of interactions and things i don't know that would be interesting to see but yeah you could imagine that you could feed it not only the actual writings but all of the commentary ever created on the writings and of course they don't have access to today's information as well and eh, you could come up with some interesting things, but um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I had to chime in there on that mm -hmm. particular point. No, I agree that that would be interesting. Oh, oh, one other, yeah. one other thing I want to bring up is Tanner. You did an excellent job of portraying the, the let's say the video game side of the AI, wor AI, AI world. But let me go a little bit deeper because that's what I do. Um, the so. I, I was trying to look up the book. I'll find it later. But basically, there, there was a book that talked about how 
What happens when the virtual world becomes more advantageous to live in than the real world? And we see soft versions of this with people that are hyper interested in games. But what happens when, like, it becomes like a societal wide thing? Because, I mean, look at it this way. Like, in the virtual world, let's say that you. There was this. Oh, I'm so mad I can't find the book. But there's this idea of, like, a coffin where you, you go sit in a. Um, chamber essentially that's hooked up to all of your nerves your visual your audio inputs etc and you enter into a world of virtual reality world that's indistinguishable from the real world effectively speaking and but there's also no consequences so there's no true you don't truly die in this world and yet you can live death a thousand times you can play games where you actually do die you can play games where your pain is is actually you know, from your perspective, real pain. Or you could dial that back. But in this world, you can be whoever you want to be. You know? You know that pimple you don't like? You know that way that your nose looks? You can change that. So then what happens when that reality that you're in with all these people that you've met, these, these not real people in the game, but they're real in real life people, what happens when interacting in that realm becomes more advantageous than the real world. And I think we're we're moving towards that. Although I will say the VR side of things has been somewhat of a flop. I mean, if you look at what the projections were in terms of people using VR and AR and those things have been much less than what we thought they would be, which is interesting to note. But nonetheless, I still think this is very possible, especially as it gets more advanced. Um... So it's just some another another layer there, Tanner, to what you're saying. So yeah, I think yeah. there's <clears throat> a line there um, because, like you're saying, once it gets to a certain degree, like if you start to have, you know, a lot of freedom, like what we've been talking about inside the game, I feel like it's going to like flip on its head, and then it's not going to become meaningful at all anymore. Um, I think, mm. yeah, I think this reminds me a lot of like, uh, have you like the experience machine? Like you can go inside a machine and experience like anything you want. Um, and I think that's kind of what it sounds similar to. And I think a lot of people don't like the idea of that because it's because of that very thing, because it's like, it's not, cause there's like a realness in a, a genuineness that isn't there and i think that is like you know maybe part of the reason why like the vr sets aren't as crazy as they thought they would be for people and maybe that's gonna be the case still even if it gets more and more advanced yeah it'll be interesting to see what do you think harley yeah it's just the ignorance of i've really only played one video game and i haven't tried out vr much so it's like hard to know i could speculate but yeah i'm kind of i'm kind of the guy who's like hmm maybe when i have a family i'm going to like screens won't exist for a few for the first many years of their life or maybe they will but like they won't or like i want them to live in the real world for a while to see if they like it you know or <laughs> like, i don't know I mean, like <laughs> i was just going to say like the data's pretty damn clear like phones in terms of like from a mental health perspective is a net negative i mean there's basically no doubt about it um social media too yeah it was it's probably more the social media aspect than the phone itself yeah. but yeah what do you how do you craft that particular policy yeah i'm gonna slide the convo to the next speaker which i thought was kind of a he was kind of less of a philosophy man, but just uh, seemed like an old wise man, John Van Donk. And he was talking about this idea of like, you know, no matter where you are in life, no matter your scenario, no matter how old you are, you're always searching for that more, always yearning for that next location, next scenario, you know, hypothetical future. Like, it's like, I guess it's a lesson for me of like, hmm. I think of myself sometimes like, oh, it'd be so nice when I reach this and I reach that and I reach that. But it's like, it's nice to notice that like, even at 80, 
you're gonna still be searching for more. So it's like, I guess a lesson of enjoy what you have in the moment because it, it passes so quick and it's kind of all you do have. It's kind of just idea of like settling into the present. And I, I found that to be kind of a cool concept. Just a good reminder for me, at least. What do you guys think of the John Van Donk and that concept or Tanner? Um, I agree. I think that's good. I think I like the idea that I think of sometimes when I think of people that I know and how they behave. That's like if you're not happy where you are right now, you're likely not going to be happy wherever you're going to trying to go um, because you're just going to be searching for more. Like he was saying, um, are going to realize that everything that you were basing your happiness on this potential future isn't all that it cracked up to be um, because I don't know. I like the idea. We, I think we talked about it a bit with Grimm, uh, you know, just like a comment that's like, wherever you go, there you are. So it's like you have to be able to be content and happy with yourself, ideally in whatever circumstance, uh, you know, regardless of what it is that you're constantly seeking. Yeah, like th this idea of like, oh, mm. I'll be happy when I finally do this thing. Or once this vacation comes up, I'll finally be fulfilled. Like, is that kind of what you're getting at? Because that concept is, in a lot of sense, a, a fake concept. It doesn't yes. really exist. What you find yeah. is that if you're not actually living a life that you enjoy day to day, yes, you, you're not going to enjoy that two week vacation. It's it, all the all the hype is overblown. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like. It's you're idealizing it and romanticizing it and it's just going to be over and done and then you're going to be back where you are now. And it's like, um, yeah, the day to day comment. I like that because that's exactly right. It's like you shouldn't be putting your happiness and everything that you are in the future. You should be living exact like living as best you can now in the way that you want so that you can be happy yeah okay mm. hold up gotta make the gotta make the four hour work week plug harley mm. uh mm. tim tim ferris so harley got me on this book tanner uh this tim ferris four hour work week book i'd put it i'm only like three hours in and i'd already put it in the you know shelf next to rich dad poor dad robert kiyosaki which i would say is my personal most foundational finance business entrepreneurship book now i haven't Plus read a ton yeah. yeah i haven't read a ton so i guess i don't have a great pool but it's, it's just really good regardless and he talks about this concept of like okay so let's let's do some math here so you're gonna work 40 hour 50 hour work weeks the rest of your life for 50 years 40 years to go into retirement and then what do nothing for 30 years it he that wasn't a perfect explanation, but essentially he just he just rips apart the current way in which our society looks at work, life, vacation, etc., and essentially makes the case for what you just did, which is that if you aren't living how you want to day to day, there isn't some heaven in the future of oh suddenly when I do X or Y. I'm going to suddenly love my life. and Or when I get to this point, it's suddenly going to be better. Be better. That's the wrong perspective. you got to think about how can I now change things to get to the point where I'm happy to wake up in the morning. And it's not – I'll a caveat here. It's not like it's not that simple. I mean sometimes you have to work so you don't starve. You know, like it's not, it's not as simple as that. But it's an important point. And, you know, from a stoic perspective – um it's critical you know you have to learn to appreciate the moment now um or or, or you fail and tanner i was curious you want to bring up uh your uh your lovely poster i was hoping you could talk about this this was like one of the highlights of the trip yeah that was a good one this is so good yeah um the momentum already probably. sorry one sec yeah Just so I have a poster on my wall, framed, 
and it says Memento Moria at the top, which means remember you must die. And on the poster, there's like a bunch of little squares, and at the end of them, it says like 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way down to 80. And each one of those squares is one week. And like the thought is that you can do it however often as you want, but like you fill in each one of those squares for every week that you've lived. And then you just look, it's like looking at your life in one frame. You see like this blocked out chunk and you see this unfilled chunk and you think like, wow, that's how much I've already used up. Who knows when I'm going to die? It might not even be nearly to the end, but even if it was, it's not even that long. So it's a reminder that, man, I should get to work. I have stuff that I want to do. I can't be squandering my time um, and because I am going to die. That's a reality. I'm not going to live forever. And I feel like a lot of it's easy to fall into the trap of feeling like you are, especially when you're young. Um, and then it has at the bottom a quote by Seneca um, that I can paraphrase. It's, it's something like, um, it's not that we have too little time um, to live our lives, but that we squander much of it. Like the greatest things in life can be achieved if we're using all of it well. And I agree. It's a great poster and I really like it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I, I guess my thoughts I've been going down the past few months is like kind of trying to inspire people to like create the life they want to live, create the life that like gets you so excited and so, you know, captivated. Like if you're living life w wondering about the next chapter all the time, that means your current chapter probably isn't that awesome and amazing and interesting. And I'm kind of a, like if your current chapter isn't that good, the probability that your next one isn't going to be very good either is high. So it's like, I, it's all in line with like, your life is insanely short. Time is probably the most precious resource we have. And recognizing both of those things, it's probably a, it's been useful for me and probably will be useful for other people. Like this whole grass is greener. It's not true. The grass is greenest right now in the present in your own mind. Like if you're able to master just even like, I guess bringing in atomic habits. Like if you're able to bring in small little habits each day that bring you fulfillment, meaning, et cetera, like you're already winning, you're making wins and you're creating a day and a life. You're creating a day that you're waking up and enjoying and then you're going to create that a life that is worth enjoying. And so, yeah, it's all just small, continuous improvements to the path of, I guess, meaningful life and I guess Peterson sometimes mentions this idea of like when you're engaged in something that is meaningful, you will know it like your heart slash soul slash being is it's like it's a timeless scenario like time is passing so quick. I have no angst about the future. I'm not worried about the past. I'm truly living in this moment, loving it. And that's just that's something I would call a lot of people to go out and find and yeah, it's it's probably a really hard thing to find, but I guess a final thing I'll say is you'll never know what you would enjoy or wouldn't enjoy until you try different things out. And so that's kind of my point here is like go out and live out an adventure. Don't sit around and watch other people's on your screens because you're going to be 80 before you know it. Tanner's poster will prove that to you. So, yeah, I guess it's just kind of a long ramble by me, but yeah. There's a couple small things I just wanted to add. I really liked what you said. I'm sorry, just like zooming in on the wording like of like uh, the grass is greener. I think it's like, yeah, like that phrase, like maybe you should cultivate the grass that is here instead of just like abandoning it and trying to find it somewhere else. Um, it reminds me of the quote that um, we must tend to our garden and it's by Candide. It's a book written by Voltaire. And it's like, I'll just very briefly talk about it, but it's like, um, sure. basically a bunch of horrible, atrocious things happen during the book to all these characters. Um, 
the, the, they're philosophers. It's like Voltaire's making fun of philosophy, a type of philosophy, because Candide's like, oh, this is the best of all possible worlds, no matter what happens. Um, and a horrible, atrocious things occur. But at the end, it does this great job of a conclusion that's like, um, regardless of these outside occurrences and what I cannot control, we must work, we must tend to our garden to keep at bay the vice and the laziness and all these other things that do nothing but sow seeds for um, nihilism and like the type of the types of lives that for sure don't equate to any meaning or any any I guess enjoyment I could say um, and that it's like regardless of what's occurred let's say if, if it's like an, an idea of if you like where you're at right now, if you're like happy to be alive or in some circumstance, the reason that you are where you are is because of everything that has happened in your past. Like you wouldn't be here if not for this bad thing that happened and this bad thing that happened. Uh, so to say that you wouldn't, you wish those things didn't happen is to deny yourself in the present, is to say that I wish that I was living a different life. So if you like truly love your fate and love yourself, then I think you, that's how you would believe, sorry, that was like a really random rant, but I think going off of what Nate said a minute ago, um, talking about, like, the books, the four-hour work week, and, um, it was reminding me that, of the thought, um, that this is, like, controversial, but, like, the, the Buddha said that suffering is in the mind. Like, um, pain and pleasure are things that we all experience and we can't avoid, but suffering is put upon oneself by the mind. And I think also, like, bliss and, like, heaven is a place in your mind as well uh, that you can attain in some sense. Um, and I think that ties into, like, being happy where you are or putting yourself into the future, a desired outcome that might not come um, you're not going to be happy there either because if you're not happy in your mind now it's likely not going to be the case then um yeah i guess that's that's what i wanted to add i i guess i should last thing um a good idea that i would recommend is getting into meditation for this type of thing um i actually recently started reading a book called how to meditate uh, it's by pema children and it's really good about giving reasons and steps on how to do it and the idea is putting yourself in the present moment and being aware and accepting of what is um and maybe learning to enjoy it as well mm. sorry there's just a lot of stuff that i was like wanted to plug yeah those are good excellent mm. If you're not happy in your mind now, what makes you think that even if you reach those goals, you're going to be able to have that happy life? Like, you got to master that mind before you're going to be able to reach anything like that. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of a, maybe a, the last few things to mention for this pod would be we actually got to sit down at a table with Jonathan Pajot, and that was kind of an interesting scenario. But I kind of want Nate to first open up this story with just a quick lesson that he learned from his dad. A lesson mm, that we all kind yes. of were thinking about at the table. Uh, yes, so my father has said many things in his days. Um, some wise, some dumb. Most pretty wise, if I'm being honest. Um, and one of the rather... Like, if I could pick any piece of knowledge that he has ingrained into me that I think is more true than anything else is this the importance of asking questions and I it's almost become a problem now because I'm so hyper fixated on whether or not the people around me and frankly myself are asking questions in conversation that it's like I'll write people off prematurely if they don't ask questions but but on a serious note people that ask interesting intelligent thought-provoking questions in conversation, like at the dinner table, for example, or if you take someone out to coffee or at, you know, some, some event or some discussion, people that do that are, in my opinion, just 
much more measured, competent, deep, meaningful people than people that don't. So as a litmus test, it can be a little brutal sometimes, but when you have a conversation with someone, someone that's your friend, it's interesting to note how much, how many questions they're asking you, how many questions you're asking them, how much are they talking about themselves, and then also when, here's another interesting heuristic, if you bring up something that's bugging you or a problem or a piece of bad news, how do they react to such things? Do they immediately try to, in some sense, one-up you with something bad that's happening to them? Or do they empathize and listen? And those those two two metrics here, the asking questions metric and how they take bad news, are two very important metrics. And one thing that bugged me, and I think bugged you guys as well, was when we were sitting at this table with Jonathan Peggio, the two individuals at the table did not ask questions. Instead, they both had, in one case, 20-plus minute-long monologues to, I think, just tell Mr. Peggio, which... Now, here's where it gets tricky, and we can talk about this, I suppose. Is like, mm-hmm. well, is that inherently bad? Well, I don't necessarily think it's inherently bad, but there's eight people at the table. So for the 45, 50-minute dinner, for you to take up 25 minutes with your story, and we'll just leave it at that at the moment, that doesn't end with a question mark for the person that was nice enough to sit down with you that's you know, relatively famous and is the speaker there that's trying to give you hypothetical wisdom, I just think is a bad look, personally. And it was kind of frustrating because then you're dominating the conversation. It's not a conversation. It's just a monologue. And you're not asking a question. And that's what we witnessed. And it was just, it was weird is honestly the best way to describe it. It was strange and kind of disappointing for the people around us. What, what do you guys think of that description? Yeah, I it was I was noticing it kind of right away. I even noticed it in the estuary group before. Like I noticed mm. that there were some people that like felt as if they needed to kind of cut into the convo after each speaker had each person had kind of went around in this group, and it was just kind of like I'm the person who's more like. I'm not going to butt in as often. So like I butt in almost never when like that scenario is occurring. Cause I just, I just won't talk as much. I'll just kind of take it in. And it's, some, yeah, I was kind of getting slightly just annoyed and kind of disappointed. Of like, man, man, I kind of want like, maybe like, this is where I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. Like mm. I might've been a person who blabbed about himself a lot more until I kind of, two or three years ago heard that from your dad and like it like sunk in one night after like hanging out with some people and I was like I was trying to figure out why was that not interesting to me why did I not enjoy that why 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 would I not want to hang out with them again and Nate kind of brought it up he was like they didn't ask me a single question they didn't ask any of us a single question they talked about them and that's kind of what I was noticing and to give the benefit of the doubt some people might not recognize maybe the importance of that or maybe some people don't ha- hold it to uh, as high a regard as maybe me or you or some of the sure. other people but like uh man maybe i could see it uh, they could see it on my face but i was just kind of like you know uh ask more questions and shut up that's what i wrote down on this paper like to myself like as a lesson like make sure to just not be the guy who's blabbing the entire time because it's just not a good look but either way i yeah. What do you think, Tanner? Yeah. I know you're kind of more a silent, listening, wise counsel who listens and listens and <laughs> listens and then soaks up all the gems. <laughs> and then after everyone is done speaking, the silence happens and then Tanner comes out with like just this most beautiful poetic wisdom. So yeah, I definitely <laughs> okay. think Tanner's on this train. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> the kind words and um, extrapolation. Um, I guess, no, I mean, I agree, obviously. Like, it's not 
the thing to do is never to uh that's like that's not a conversation like they were kind of giving mini speeches to pejo and it's a it is a worse even when it doesn't when it's not they're not even like asking him anything it's just like saying information and then not saying anything else and it's just kind of strange to see an interaction like that because i haven't in a while at least it's you know yeah no i just haven't and um i guess all i would say maybe is that that's you, you shouldn't do that um i don't really blame them necessarily like obviously ideally they wouldn't do that, but, you know, people are mistaken all the time about what they should do, and I feel like, I, at the time, I wasn't really upset at them, because I figured, you know, like, kind of what you were saying, Harley, that they're at a different place, maybe, in their lives, and, yeah, it's it's definitely not good, and I don't condone it, and I could say more about it or talk to them about it, but it's it's not like... You know, it's not like something that I can control for them, so I shouldn't really get upset about it. I guess that's how I look at it or how I felt. Um, but I do, it, I do get that it's like we have time that we're supposed to be interacting with him. Like it'd be good to give everyone a shot. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of butted in and asked Pajo a question, and it was like I said who would you have a conversation with living or dead or who would you most want to have a conversation with? He was saying St. Gregory and St. Philip, but he kind of gave a short answer and it's like, he almost wasn't interested in my question, maybe because of the way I was looking at my paper, <laughs> but whatever it was, it was just a kind of a fascinating little table talk. But one, I guess a final thing I kind of wanted to mention was this idea of like, well, it was a weird one, like fasting near death or like this mm -hmm. idea of like fasting might actually bring thoughts into your mind that could be godly or spiritual or you might reach different states in your mind in through the fasting. And Paggio was just talking about how like his goal is to like be able to do that at times, maybe on his deathbed, but just in general to kind of reach that maybe closer connection with what is higher. And I found that to be interesting because I've never really fasted. I talk about intermittent fasting, but I had never really done a four-day fast or something like that. I don't know what you guys think of all that. but Well, I, I guess, yeah, you've talked about intermittent fasting. I guess that's the idea, but just extended. Um probably more benefits i would assume i fast i've only fasted like one day like maybe like 36 hours is the most that i fasted and i'd say it was a good experience um yeah i didn't really it's interesting how you you don't really like feel super hungry after like 24 hours your body just kind of gets used to it um but i think i guess talking um, literally, I think it would be really admirable for someone to be like in a situation where they're, they know that their time is up or they're like so accepting of death that they kind of push it forward themselves and just like fast and pray and stop eating until death. I thought that that idea that he was proposing was pretty interesting and pretty bold. Yeah, I would agree. I don't have a ton to add. It was a very mm -hmm. uh, u unique topic in terms of, you know, taking a, you know, increasing your agency in a time where your body is failing you to kind of make a thing more on your terms uh, is a fascinating idea. So, yeah. For sure. Well, yeah, it's getting slightly late here at in the KZU and... I think it might be a good place to wrap up, but any closing thoughts, y'all? Like, I appreciate you guys sliding on, and I think this was it was very useful for me to just kind of rethink all this and also see Tanner again. It's it was a great time. 
Uh, not, not too much on my end. Uh, good conference. Glad we went. Uh, definitely a lot of things I'm still sitting on, but good to, good to chat about them. So, yeah. I agree. Uh, it was a fun time. I'm glad that we went and you guys got to come and, uh, you know, see the place and uh, have some good conversations. And, uh, yeah, as always, I enjoy having these talks. And, you know, thanks for having me on, Harles. For sure. Yeah, thanks, guys, for joining. Farewell, everyone.